Hey everybody, this is Brian Audley from Incendiary, and you are listening to The New Scene. Hello everybody. And welcome to the new scene. I am your host, Keith, and we're back with another brand new episode. And on the show this week, we have the one, the only, Nathaniel Shannon. He's a well-known photographer who has photographed a ton of the bands we love in our scene. And in addition to that, he produced the Dead Guy documentary. He's released music as Nathaniel Shannon and The Vanishing Twin. And he also just wrote and released the St. Vitus Bar book, and it's out right now. It's a collection of stories and photos from St. Vitus over the past decade, and the book is fantastic. I've seen it. You need to see it. You can go to the St. Vitus website and order it right now if you want. We also have our Artist Spotlight interview for the month, and that's with Sierra Benando from the band With Sales Ahead. With Sales Ahead just released their debut LP, Infinite Void. So we talk about that record with Sierra. So make sure you stick around until the end of the show. But before we get to all of that, here's how you can support the new scene. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at New Scene Pod. Reviews. Give us five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can write a review on Apple Podcasts and you can leave episode feedback on Spotify. The push to 300 reviews is beginning very soon, so let's get a head start. Shirts. The new scene has shirts for sale at our store at Death Wish Inc. There's a variety of short sleeve options, and there's a long sleeve shirt as well. Also, you can always email me at newscenepod at iodinerecords.com. Also, don't forget to support Iodine Recordings. The debut LP from Love Letter is up for pre-order. The record is called Everyone Wants Something Beautiful. And Love Letter features founding members of Verse and Defeater. Look, it's a good band, and this record is going to be great. They've got one single out now called Misanthropic Holiday or Vacation. Go check it out. The new LP from Her Heads on Fire, called Strange Desires, is out July 19th. And they just released another new single from the LP. It's called Aren't I the Champion. Her Heads on Fire also have UK tour dates June 2nd through June 9th. Don't forget to sign up for the Iodine Noise Cult. You'll get every new Iodine vinyl release that's coming out this year. And you want all of them. Trust me. And One Line Drawing has a gig in New York City on June 9th. It's with Common Sage and Calling Hours. That's at Berlin, 25 Avenue A, June 9th. Be there. I'll be there. That's a good show. Also, don't forget to support our sponsor for the month of May. Equal Vision Records. They've got an unbeatable back catalog, and they're still killing it today. Code 7, Be Well, Keonashi, Bitter Branches, Hail the Sun, Yellow Card, The Juliana Theory, Fair Weather, and a ton more. Pick up the new LP from Hot Water Music. It's called Vowels, and it's out right now. Quicksand is supporting Hot Water Music on their U.S. tour. The next leg kicks off in June, and there's dates in Europe in November. Check out hotwatermusic.com for more information. The new 7-inch from Be Well, a tap I can't turn off, is out right now. It's their first new music in two years, and you want it. You want it right now. Now, check out EqualVision.com for more info. Also, Be Well has select upcoming tour dates with calling hours in Europe. Check their Instagram or the EBR Instagram for more information. And Senses Fail have tour dates this fall with Saves the Day. Check the EBR Instagram for a full list of dates. You can follow EBR on Instagram at EqualVision. Okay, so right now we are going to speak to Nathaniel Shannon. Enjoy. All right. We are here now with Nathaniel Shannon. Nathaniel, welcome to the show. How's it going, Keith? I'm 
I am doing very well, Nathaniel, and I'm happy to have you here because you've got a lot going on. You were producer for the Dead Guy Killing Music documentary. I did that. You were fronting Nathaniel Shannon and the Vanishing Twin. You're a very, very well-known photographer in many circles, and we have the St. Vitus Bar book, The First Ten Years, an Oral and Visual History. It's out now. I've seen all, I just saw Snapcase posted that they got the book. They did. And we're so happy to be in it. Did you see that? Yeah, Dustin sent me a message. Um, those dudes are like such incredible people. Just very, very so supportive nice. and nice. It's funny, as we were sitting down, I was setting up like my audio um, and my microphone. And I was like, oh, which mic should I use? And I have a Heil, um, whatever the whatever the fuck this is. I should know the name of it. PR35. <laughs> and I just laughed in my head. I was like, huh, I got one of these because of Daryl from Snapcase. Because uh, he was sponsored by them. And I had a great picture of him with the microphone at Vitus. And they reached out to me, the 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 microphone Heil did, and we're like, hey, we want to use this picture. And I was like, cool, send me a microphone. And they were like, okay. And I was like, well, that was easy. I guess I'm <laughs> I'm sponsored now. That's great. Yeah, Daryl is so nice. When we had him on right oh, it was the second new scene episode when we switched over, back when I had my co-host Tommy. And after we recorded, we were huge Snapcase fans, still are. And then after we recorded, we were like did you hear his voice? You can hear like the Snapcase voice mm -hmm. in his voice. <laughs> He's a great dude. They're all great. Yeah. They're like really wonderful people. Um, I've get, been fortunate in recent years to spend some time with them. Um, you mentioned the Dead Guy documentary. We've Bill uh, William Saunders that I, I made that with. Um, he and I are are working potentially with Snapcase on a project which I don't really have a lot of details on, but um, they've been really wonderful in that uh, preliminary process of, of trying to get some ball, the ball rolling on a couple of things and um, are fascinating. They're just fascinating people. Like Buffalo is fascinating to me in general because I grew up in Michigan in Detroit and there's a lot of similarities in being factory industrial towns that had economic fallouts and kind of like how that's shaped the music communities and that the local economy and sports and everything in, in between. So um, with Bill and I both being Midwestern Michigan boys, uh, there's a lot of, I kind of just like, there's just Midwest stuff, man. Like I get it. I get it. I get them in ways that maybe other people don't. Yeah. You grew up in uh, Ypsilanti, Michigan. You said it right. <laughs> Yeah. Most people call it Ypsilanti, which is fine. No, I I do my research here. You're I do very my professional. Here. I appreciate that. <laughs> Where that's like uh, south. Wait, let me think of a compass in my head. That's like southwest of Detroit near Ann Arbor, right? Yep, it is essentially the uh, rough side of the tracks of Ann Arbor in Washtenaw County, which is like twenty five thirty miles west of of um, downtown Detroit. It's college town. You know, so I grew up in essentially like a dual college town, which was wild as a kid, because from the end of May, June through like September, it's a ghost town. There's nobody there. And then the population doubles because all the students come back. Um, that also affords, I think, a little bit of cultural diversity as far as as art and um Music and whatever the fucking Arbor wants to pretend it is, is a, a very conservative liberal town that is no longer the home of the Stooges, but absolutely the home of um, boomers and tie dyed shirts. You know, we're all multimillionaires uh, <laughs> who don't particularly care for certain types of people living in their liberal town, but that's for another time. Um, my side of the tracks, though, was very diverse. We had uh, a large um, Middle Eastern population, large Asian community, um, large African community. And, you know, growing up, I kind of hated it because I didn't, I was a kid, didn't know any better. And I didn't realize where I grew up um, of having access to certain things, but also being able to like be out in the middle of nowhere in the woods, like in 10, 15 minutes, which was huge because it gave me a little bit of like a thirst for a city um, and, and chaos that comes with being on top of each other as humans, but also like I can go smell trees and roll around in the dirt whenever I want. Yeah. That's nice to have both. Yeah. 
absolutely. I love going back just simply because you can kind of have the best of both worlds. You know, even um, my my girlfriend and I ended up we were in in Brooklyn for like ninety years um, and migrated west to New Jersey um, during the pandemic because our ceiling collapsed in our apartment. So that was really that was. <laughs> That was what happened. Uh, we went on a road trip to Yellowstone into Glacier National Park because we needed to get the fuck out. And um, the, the the long version of the story is like I was pretty heavily involved shooting protests and stuff, and then it very quickly turned at least behind the camera. The people with cameras out documenting what was going on very quickly turned into like some real gross paparazzi shit. And there's one person in particular whose name I'm not going to mention, but likes to shoot music that I saw get into a, a fist fight during a silent march with a hand of other photographers. They had to be separated by the police um, because they were just trying to get that shot and make a name for themselves. And I thought that that was really fucking gross because I was just there because it was happening in my backyard. And there's a lot of people friends and family who don't live here that didn't know what was going on. And obviously the way most things are portrayed in the media is not accurate. And I wanted to be like, Hey, this is what I'm watching. These are the people that I'm watching the NYPD fuck up repeatedly and pick fights. And, um, I went to the, just, just roundabout. I went to move here to go back to school, school of visual arts and then I ended up being a TA and, and substitute there and then working admin for quite a while. And I ran into a former student of mine who was a person of color and I hadn't seen him in years. He's got a great photo career. His work's incredible. And I was like, Hey man, I got like a real honest question. I was like, what do you, what do you feel about frankly, white people out here shooting this thing that is not obviously about us? And he was just like, he looked at me and he's like, man, you got to do what you got to do. And I was like, okay, I, I understand what you're saying to me. And, um, I was at the front of this protest going over the Manhattan bridge and, and Rachel, my girlfriend was like back further in the crowd. And I texted her and I was like, I'm done. I'll meet you on the other side of the bridge. And she's like, what's going on? I was like, I'll explain later. But this one photographer like got into a fight with these other photographers and it was this paparazzi bullshit. And then he was having his picture taken in like the Shea Guevara, like fist bump. Oh no. Like, like getting his picture taken with the protest happening behind him. And I was like, I don't want to be one of these motherfuckers. It's the same reason. Like I don't shoot arena shows and I'm like very pretentious about who's behind the camera, even shooting music because this has been my life for a majority of my life. And I'm a super nerd and pretentious about it. I do not want to be grouped in with these other people. Anyway, so we bailed. Um, we went out to Yellowstone, which was incredible to be in Yellowstone um, at 20% capacity and rode the wave of the pandemic and, and the country shutting down, um, which was wild to leave the liberal bubble of New York City. Uh, we went to Glacier. Um, I tore my meniscus and fractured my tibia hiking in Glacier National Park, which was hilarious because I, I slipped and fell taking a picture of a waterfall, uh, which for all the years shooting aggressive music, there is nothing harder than taking pictures of waterfalls in the middle of the day. <laughs> <laughs> that shit, like, it's, there's a skill to that, you know? Um, and I hurt myself pretty bad. So we decided to slowly migrate back to Brooklyn. And in the meantime, my old roommate was kind of watching over our apartment. And he called me one morning and was like, hey, man, your ceiling collapsed. And I was like, what are you talking about? So we drove from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, back to Brooklyn, like two and a half days, which was intense also because my leg was <laughs> like I couldn't walk. Um, and we had like 30 days to find a new place to live. So we migrated to New Jersey. What is the point of all of this? I now live a 25 minute train ride from Manhattan and a 10 minute walk from a nature preserve. And I can go look at deer and smell trees and roll around in the dirt, or I can go watch bands and watch people punch themselves in the face or each other in the face, <laughs> uh, at venues like Vitus whenever I want. And like that kind of best of both worlds brought, um, a calmness. <laughs> I should say to, I think myself that I hadn't felt in a very long time living in this stress that is Brooklyn, you know, yeah. 
that stress is really good at sometimes, you know, you can, you can make some diamonds out of stress, but at the same time, I'm not trying to make diamonds. I just want to like live and not worry about what my neighbors are doing. <laughs> are you happier in Jersey? Um, that's a fantastic question. I'm happier living in a calmer environment. I, as a Midwest boy, didn't realize that 90% of New Jersey is all just forest and it's the um, garden state because it literally is just a big forest. And then there's like Metro Newark. Um, it's served its purpose. I'm not going to pretend that I want to stay here forever, but like quality of life has improved dramatically um, since, since we migrated over here. And that's something I, I absolutely appreciate every day. You know, I don't like have to get up and get on the subway. Now I have to sit in traffic, uh, in a car, but, um, at least I'm in control of that. <laughs> Not at the yeah. mercy of like what, you know, 20 other freaks in the subway car may or may not do when I'm just like trying to go do literally anything. Yeah. Cause I wonder if I'll be here forever. I, right now I want to be, but I, I work from home 90% of the time so I can avoid most annoying things except my asshole airbnb lord neighbor oh. but hey everyone's got one thing to worry about in this that's city. absolutely true so tell me about your relationship with punk hardcore music i'm in, i'm always interested in people's trajectory what grabbed you and then tell us about your intro to punk and hardcore and, and what grabbed you in that area as well i grew up in ypsilanti michigan as i said dual college town and you know, the legends of the Stooges and MC5. And um, even when I was in high school, Wolf Eyes before Sonic Youth, like introduced Wolf Eyes to the masses, which is still like hilarious to me. Um, they were just like this annoying, annoying noise band that like just were so antagonistic all the time. Um, that stuff was kind of familiar, you know, because it was just part of like the local culture. And I was very fortunate to grow up with a radio station, two radio stations, one being um, WCBN, which was U University of Michigan's college radio. And there was uh, a really fantastic show on Friday nights called the Friday Night Grind that introduced me to a lot of like grind and screamo, whatever, just noisy shit um, on top of just everything. It was college radio. You know, it's all over the place from jazz to like pavement, Sonic Youth, what was, you know, be considered traditional college radio replacements and shit to like. So your college stuff. radio station would, would play grind bands? Yeah, there was for a very long That's time. Sick. You know, I, I, th I think it's, it's, it's reminiscent of like Crucial Chaos, you know, being on East Village Radio of, you know, a little bit later. But I don't, I don't even remember who it was that had the show, but like it was on for a really long time. And I think the torch got passed. Um, but that, that was something there was a dude named Jeremy Fisher, who I still am friends with on the internet. And he had a radio show called King Fisher radio and he would play, you know, punk hardcore misfits, like, uh, helicopters, um, groovy ghoulies, like kind of like horror punk stuff. I remember the day he played Sunny Day Real Estate, and I was like, what the fuck is this? L listen to these pop sensibilities. Um, actually, there was actually another, yeah, so th there was WCBN, and then there was a high school radio, like a high school, a couple towns over in Plymouth, Michigan, that they had like a high school radio station that they also, in the mid to late 90s, started playing what high school kids are into of the, like, you know, at least locally in Detroit, it's like, oh, they're playing current, uh, or more domestically like Indian summer into like early Jimmy world before, you know, they made their money off of Apple commercials and j rightly so. Um, and it was also cool. Cause it was like, oh, these are kids my age, like playing music that I don't know about. Um, there's a band from, from Metro Detroit called Empire State Games, who I absolutely love, uh, who produced, um, my good friend Rodrigo, who now plays in Saves the Day, which is still fucking weird as shit to me. But, um, he was in this band, Empire State Games. So that was like a local band that I heard on like high school radio, uh, which is pretty cool, like retrospectively. But the big one 
was living in proximity to Canada. There was a radio station called 89X, which was in Windsor, Ontario, which is right across the river from Detroit. It's directly east of Detroit because there is now South Detroit and that journey song is fucking bullshit um, because South (laughs) Detroit is really the Detroit River and Windsor, Ontario. But I digress from that. Anyway, whatever the Canadian FCC laws, the CCC laws, um, dictate that you have to play like 70% or whatever percentage Canadian music, right? And because of that, like they were playing the Smashing Pumpkins and Pearl Jam and, you know, replacements and, and all of the things that were happening in the early 90s. But they also played Canadian bands. So I got introduced to like a shit ton of Canadian music that never broke. Maybe if you had much music or access to much music, but like just never broke in the United States. You know, I feel like Seattle got some of that. Detroit got some of it. Buffalo got some of it because they're all border towns. But um, there is a band in particular called Mystery Machine who are still probably one of my absolute favorite bands. They were from Vancouver that were like this kind of shoegazy but like three and a half, four minute pop song band that were just like absolutely incredible. But that introduced me to, you know, like my bloody Valentine, the Catherine wheel and um, pure and limb lifter and I mother earth. And like just all this Canadian music. And that to me was like my education outside of my town. And then by the time I got to high school, the sky explosion had happened and a neighbor of mine <laughs> ended up playing trombone in a local Christian ska band. And they used to play all the time with ska that was happening in Detroit. Um, at the time, Derek Grant, who played drums in the Suicide Machines and Thoughts Ionesco, uh, the most underrated band of all time, um, had a, a record label called Beat Hotel, or was part of Beat Hotel. And it was ska label, and it was ska you know, uh, part of 89 X's beauty too, is on Sunday nights, they had, um, a show called the homeboy show and they would feature local bands. So that was like, I heard the suicide machines or speedball, uh, or by then the laughing hyenas had broken up cause, uh, uh, Larissa was, had been dead for a considerable amount of, or a couple of years, but like they were playing local music and, and, I feel very fortunate to like, I got to listen to what was happening locally through three different radio stations, Mm. which is wild versus having, you know, that older sibling that gave you a tape or whatever. I did have my neighbors, Mark and Jason, you know, got into cooler music before I did because they're, you know, four or five years older than I am. But (laughs) really my neighbor being in this Christian ska band got me going to shows in Detroit and that just blew open the door. Um, you know, and, and we were also at the at early advent of the internet or message boards started popping up. Um, Andy Demps, who was most notable for being an earth mover, had uh, his label plus minus records that had a website and a message board. So that was like show listings. And, you know, I feel fortunate. Well, I guess like, I don't, I don't even know what to compare it to, you know, kids now have like fucking YouTube and Snapchat and all this shit, which is great. It's easy access. And like, they don't have to like put that much in effort into like finding their people. Um, I feel fortunate that like I found this message board and just never looked back. You know, I just started going to Detroit all the time and just immersed myself in, in this world of like, I gotta get the fuck out of my hometown. Um, and just go meet people and go watch bands play. Yeah, message boards were huge. I was on, let me think, two or three of them over the years. The Bridge Night Board? Uh, all right, I posted there like <laughs> once. All right, I, I, was, I used to post that's on the Trustkill board. Okay. sure. And someone made a thread on Bridge Nine. They're like, what Trustkill posters do you want to see over here? And someone mentioned me. And I was like, oh, look at me. So I made like one, I made an account and posted once on Bridge Nine. And then I was like, "Eh, eh, nah, I just didn't take. I only bring that up. I was not a part of the Bridge Nine board. Um, It was just kind of not my thing. But like people had the Bridge Nine board. I had the plus minus records board. And like anybody in Detroit of our age bracket would be like, oh, yeah, man, I was all over that thing. But like that kind of stuff, I think, is awesome in retrospect. Yeah. You know, uh, 
I, I think like the gatekeeping of like, you guys didn't have it as hard as we did. Like who gives a shit, man? That's what progress is. May, why, why does everything like have to be difficult? You know, you and I had message boards and that's how like we met people and like got into newer, cooler stuff. You know, you just grow as a person. Like there's nothing wrong with that. No, not at all. Not at all. So you moved to Detroit. Did you move to Detroit? I never, I never lived in Detroit, but, um, There is something hilarious about repping Detroit when you leave Michigan that people respect you in a way that is like borderline hilarious of like, oh, you're from Detroit, even to the point of wearing a Detroit Tigers baseball hat, um, working various music venues around the city. Uh, I befriended some DMS dudes at a venue um, that I used to work at. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We're all wonderful people. And it was like, oh man, fucking Detroit, cold as life, dude, CTYC. And I was like, yep, man, born to land hard. You know, and it's like, you just throw out those references and it's like, all right, yeah, this what's up. You get that fist bump of like recognition <laughs> that I still see. I still I'd think be it's too funny. afraid. I'd be too afraid that they would consult the DMS records and find out that I wasn't born in Detroit. <laughs> and then I'd, and then I'd be in trouble. Cause in Philly, it's like, you know, if you say you're from Philly, but you weren't born in the city, they will swarm you yeah, and sure. gatekeep you th- uh, through the roof. I think everybody in Detroit, at least in the 90s and into the early 2000s, were so fucking drunk and coked out of their minds. And it is such a degenerate zombie town that I don't know <laughs> that anybody had the focus to to like jump kids from the burbs who were like repping, <laughs> repping the streets. <laughs> And I say that with like fond adoration of the town, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I, I have all the respect in the world for Philly, but, uh, look, it just depends on the conversation. If I'm talking, if I'm talking to someone quick and casually and they're like, where are you from? I'll say Philly. Cause it, that's shorter than saying, well, I grew up in Bucks County, but then I lived in Philly for nine yeah, years yeah, yeah, and sure. then I lived in, Bro- you know, like who has time for all yeah, that? Yeah. I don't tell people I'm from Ypsilanti cause they're like from Yips of what? Like Detroit, man. Straight. They're like, wow, you're European? Yeah, yeah. super Greek. <laughs> super Greek with the last name Shannon. <laughs> so how did you get into photography? Was that your first interest? Is that what you pursued coming out of the gate? Tell us about that. I think I was always drawn to like visual art, look, you know, pining over album notes and, and pictures and, and album artwork as well as like, my parents always took me to the Detroit Institute of Art, which I, I think just got ranked as like one of the best art museums in America, which is awesome. They have a really incredible collection. I loved um, the Impressionist, like Monet's color palette, I still think is like fantastic. And I was really into painting as a kid. Um, and at my high school, we had like art one and art two, which I took like 15 times. Um, to the point where the teacher was like, you can just go sit and there was like a storage closet and they were like, you can just go sit in the storage closet and do whatever the fuck you're going to do. And I had a friend, um, who wanted to do dual enrollment at the local community college, which they would allow us to leave our senior year an hour early. So rather than like seven classes or six classes, like you could skip a class and then do a college class. So I took photography, like intro to photography at Washtenaw Community College, which was great because that school is state funded and majority of the faculty all teach at like Wayne State in Detroit or U of M or wherever locally. And their photo program was amazing. And um, I was like, yeah, I'll just pick up a camera. It seems fun. It seems easier than painting, Um, which it totally is. And I had my, a friend of my parents ha, used to be a portrait photographer who was retired. So he gave me my first camera, a Minolta SLR 101, SRT 101, should know that. Um, and that just set me kind of running out the door. And, you know, I by then was like going to shows occasionally, you know, around town. Um, and I just started to bring that camera with me. And the first time I ever like developed a picture in the dark room and like watched the emulsion convert this piece of paper that is just white 
And then this image I made, I captured the soul I took, like popped up in the developing tray. I've been chasing that dragon for 60 years now at this point of kind of trying to get that feeling again, which I don't know. It's becoming an addiction at this point. Like I can't go anywhere without a camera. You know, it's, it's become a source of memory. It's become a source of, of like, I, I, this is just another part. It's an appendage, you know, having a camera of some sort. And I think a lot of it is chasing that initial feeling of like, wow, man, like I made this, I made this and I still don't understand how this technology works. Shooting film of like, there's this piece of plastic that gets exposed and then you put some chemicals on it and then shine that on paper through like with light behind it you know it's still like i'm still fascinated by that Mm. do you remember what that first picture was um i do and it's moderately embarrassing come on you gotta tell us uh it might have been the former band anti-flag oh who who recently got disc decommissioned um yeah. Actually, I don't know if that's true. No, that's not true. The first one, I think the first show I ever really shot, besides having like a disposable camera, like I took disposable pictures of Elastica on their second album tour, uh, which was great, was um, Nina Gordon from Veruca Salt put out a solo record that like had like a pretty big pop single on it. And she played a venue called The Shelter in Detroit, which is like a small downstairs of St. Andrew's Hall and the pictures are absolutely dog shit and it sucks because I love her and I love, love Veruca Salt and it would be cool to have like better pictures of her but I think that, that was the first one where at least like I'm like oh there's a shape there's a shape of a person and I was there and like I pointed this metal thing at this person and now like I have this image forever which is like pretty wild yeah Yeah, it's pretty exciting. I remember the first time I went to a show and brought a disposable camera and I I took a bunch of bad pictures and it was when you would drop it in the bag and leave it at Rite Aid or whatever and they would develop the pictures for for you. That was really exciting. And I used to film a lot of shows too back in the day, Like, uh, but then people would expect it. And and one day the quality was not what everyone was used to. So it was like a room full of people like, Oh, what did you? What are you doing? And then I stopped filming out of protest, and I never filmed a show again. Did anything like that ever happen to you, where just people expected it, and then you're like, "Dude, yeah, that's not what I'm here for." Um, I find it almost as I was saying, like I find it impossible to go watch bands play without a camera, partially because even if like Keith M is on stage playing, and you're like, "Yeah, man, we're friends. I'll put you on the list, whatever." There's that expectation I have that I think you have of me to take a picture, even though I don't think anybody really gives a shit. Um, But I have that expectation because I also know like, oh, Keith M's playing. If I go to that, I bet I'm going to get better pictures than everyone because I'm a pretentious dick. But it's also (laughs) because I've been doing this for a very long time and I like Keith M. You like me enough to invite me or put me on a list. And there's that kind of like... um, mutual gentleman's agreement um versus i think really you just want me to be there because you want me to see what you're doing more than you care uh and every now and then you know friends will be like oh did you get any pictures and i was like no man i was just watching you play (laughs) see you sound as neurotic as me okay yeah i I, it's a hundred percent a neuroses i'm gonna tell you right now nathaniel if i ever invite you to a show all right if if I just want you to come to the show, I'm just going to invite you. But if I want you to take spe- if I want you to take pictures, I'm going to specifically ask you. Yeah. So it's that easy. There you go. It's yeah. that easy. You know, it, it's funny because like I I went and shot Mets last week, who were yeah. incredible and homies, and um, Gouge Away opened, and I had never seen them before. They were great. Um, I think what they're doing is very, very cool. I love what all the kids are doing of like taking Lemonheads, early 90s alternative rock and like combining it with hardcore. It's just like so fresh and just not another dumb fucking hardcore band. And I watched them play and I didn't take pictures. And 
I went through the Met stuff to send some pictures over to them, and I was like, why didn't I take pictures of the opening, man? <laughs> Other than I was like, I just didn't feel like it at the time, and I just really enjoyed watching them play, and I have that memory in my head, and that's my memory, not a memory that I can share with anybody besides telling you, but the whole next day I was like, man, I should have done that. Why didn't I do that? And <laughs> I kind of started to beat myself up because I felt like an asshole. I was like, is Gouge Way gonna like be like, what the fuck, man? You took pictures of of the the band that you're friends with and not us, even though we don't know each other at all. You know? Yeah, I was thinking about this the other day. Cause I get wrapped up in that too. I'm like, do I follow this band? Do I follow this person? They didn't follow me. Uh, do I go to the show? Do I post them in the story? Do I post them on the timeline? All that stuff. Are they mad they're on the show? Are they mad they're not on the show? What I've realized is no one cares. Nobody cares, dude. <laughs> no one has ever come to me and said like, hey, you didn't do this or why didn't you do that ever? It's funny, like the more technology progresses and the more we're up in each other's business, the least less people give a shit about what everybody's doing under the right. guise of everybody cares about what I'm doing which is just proven time and time again. I'm sure you experience it playing music where like, it's like, yeah, man, we got all these people that liked our thing on the internet and then nobody shows up. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> exactly. And it's hard. Like, especially I think with playing music or doing photos or the art, um, this conversation, Damien Moyle and I have constantly of like, our solo project, like I never had like the music success he has with like culture and as friends for us to morning again, all that shit. But even with his solo stuff, I know he's very frustrated about the fact that like nobody gives a shit because it's not what he's known for the same way. Like if I take photos that are not bands, if I take nature stuff, which I love, or I've gotten way back into painting in like recent years and doing these like weird, um, like stained glass alien portraits. Nobody gives a shit. They're like, yeah, but where are the pictures of Snapcase? <laughs> like, well, I, did, did, they, did they play? No. That's why you, you got to do things just for you. You know, 100%. sometimes. And that's what yeah, like, I always come back to is like, why are you recording this? Why are you making yeah. this record? So you can share it with me, so I can share it with you, so I can share it with my friends. And and that's good. You know, that process of creativity, or creating rather, um, is what keeps us sane. Because we have to. Because if we don't, exactly. like, what's the fucking point? I have to. I have to. It saves me now. Mm -hmm. I, I If I wasn't doing all this stuff, I don't know what I'd be doing. Nothing. Or you'd be yeah. dead. I, I, one of those, probably. Probably. You'd be dead doing nothing. I would be dead doing nothing. <laughs> you know? And it, but, but that's also like a fascinating thing to get into comparing yourself of like, well, what would I be doing? You can't compare yourself to anybody else of what you would be doing based on this is all you know. So like how, unfortunately, while we judge ourselves, we shouldn't because there is nothing else. It's just been this path, you know? Hmm. That's interesting. Wow. Hold on. I'm going to think about Get that for a deep, second. Keep them. <laughs> I like this. I, I needed this today. I needed Me this too. today. I can't tell you how much. I don't want to disappoint my audience. I didn't ask you how you were doing today in the, in the beginning of the show. So um, how are you? I had a day where I almost quit my job and walked out several times. What do you do? I take product photos for a very successful toy company who are just absolute garbage people and um <laughs> trying to think about not incriminating myself because i really just want to throw them under the bus because i hate this place so much now I, I i lucked out and got handed a job last august shooting product photos for um uh, a toy company in based out of New Jersey who are very, very successful. And it is the most stressful, frustrating job of just an entire company full of like just absolutely incompetent and negligent people who have somehow just skated by and made money over the years. And, and I work on a creative team who are absolutely awesome, amazing people. And we've kind of bonded through how traumatic and terrible this company is. Um, and today was one of those days where I was like, I can't do this shit anymore. Like, I'm just going to leave, like, in the middle of the day. 
And I came home and I gave my girlfriend a hug and I was like, I need like 20 minutes by myself. <laughs> Want to fucking murder everybody. And uh, I put on some YouTube kettlebell exercises and I sweated and I had some food and now we're talking and I feel infinitely better just being able to converse with another human who has shared interests um, and can commiserate. <laughs> Good, good. I, I had a similar day. Now, nothing major happened, but it was just one of those days. I work a I work as an analyst for a large company during the day, and it was just one of those Did days where I... Uh, no, no. I'm going to tell you after this, and uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kind of blow your mind. Okay. I'll also tell you who I work for after this. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Now, nothing crazy happened. I just haven't felt great lately. And I was just like, what if I just quit my job and like lived on the streets and got high and like, you know, panhandled and just did what I want to do from now on. And then I was like, well, maybe I shouldn't do that. So I, what I do is I lay in bed and I'll put the covers like over my head just so, and I like, I'll leave my eyes open so I can kind of see out what's going on. And I laid there for like an hour and then I got up and (laughs) But now that I'm actually talking to another person, I feel better. I uh, My morning ritual is I get up, I pee, I make coffee, and then I go lay back in bed for like 20 minutes and just stare at the ceiling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's nice. It kind of is. It kind of is. Uh, you know, it's, um, I guess, a little bit of self-care and medic- meditation of of just like, fuck, I have to get out of bed again. But at the same time. I can get out of bed today, so I guess it could be worse because I could like not be able to walk. Now, Nathaniel, you were the producer of the Dead Guy Killing Music documentary. Is this true? These are true facts. As producer, what do you do with the documentary? Um, Bill and I had never made a documentary, and I was working several years ago at uh, Vitus, and he came by. And I, we were standing outside and he was like, do you want to make a movie about a dead guy with me? And I just looked at him and I was like, what the fuck are you talking about, man? <laughs> um, Bill works for uh, HGTV as an editor and Dave Rosenberg, drummer of dead guy, had submitted a tape to House Hunters International and Bill saw the audition tape and was like, that's Dave from dead guy. Uh, so he went to his bosses and was like, I want to, I want to be on this shoot. Like I love this dude's van. So he ended up going to, uh, Amsterdam. Dave and his family were living in Amsterdam and he was on the shoot and he was like, you are in dead guy. And Dave was like, how the fuck did you know that? (laughs) (laughs) Um, and so he, they just stayed in contact and he came back and asked me if I wanted to be a part of this thing. And we, um, we pitched it to him. And he said, yeah, okay, how much is that going to cost? We've, you know, put together a budget and started just kind of chipping away and did not think that getting them in a room together would turn into them jamming in a room together, which would then turn into them being like a now fully functional band. Yeah. Which is the weirdest thing was um, during the NHL playoffs three years ago when the Tampa Bay Lightning won. Um, current dead guy bass player, Jim Bagliano, uh, is a sound guy for the NHL. And he had given John Cooper, the Tampa Bay Lightning's coach, a dead guy shirt, which the night they won, I think it was the night they won the Stanley cup. He wore to the press conference and Rachel, my girlfriend and I were sitting on the couch and I was like, John Cooper's wearing a fucking dead guy shirt on TV because we ended up making this documentary and their bands back together. Like how weird is I love hockey. So like how weird is it that this project I work on now influenced like one of the biggest sporting events of the year with a guy who I'm pretty sure doesn't know who dead guy is, but was cool with Jim and wore the shirt Jim gave him. Um, so to ac- actually answer your question, we don't, we didn't know what the roles kind of were and Bill and I just kind of jumped in and, and he's got, the storytelling editor experience of, of chopping up video and like telling stories and, and curtailing um, stories where I, you know, always worked in stills, but 
we started shooting in the fall of 2019. We went up to uh, Maine to interview Steve Austin about recording the latter dead guy record, the screaming record. And we stopped in Connecticut and talked to the cable dudes. And um, who else did we interview? We had, we had talked to Ben Wyman and then the pandemic hit and we were like, fuck, what are we going to do? And Right previous to this, there was a screening of the Melvins documentary at Vitus. And what I loved about it was that it looked like absolute dog shit. It looked like VHS, fan, cell phone, punk. It was just the Melvins being the Melvins. And there was nothing slick about it, even though they're like a well-oiled machine. Very stylized, very particular, very hands-on in everything they do. You don't need a slick production to explain to you the longest running punkest band that had one of the most important impacts on music in America through slick storytelling. Because it's not about that. It's about them and their story. It doesn't matter how that's presented. At least that's kind of what I took from it. I'm like, huh. I really liked the way that this was put together. And I really used that like as a big influence on kind of pushing like where we were going stylistically. And then the pandemic hit and we we're like, fuck, what do we do? Not knowing that now four years exactly on the other side of that, the ways that we were experimenting with communicating with people is just part of everyday life to the point where like, I have to sit through fucking zoom team meetings all day. <laughs> yeah. Whereas like four years ago, like getting in front of like even cell phone, like FaceTime, I was like, oh, so awkward. Like, I hate this. Whereas now I'm just like, yeah, this is great. Why would I communicate any other way? Um, So what we ended up making was like this weird time capsule of a shift of technology, which I think is what Dead Guy was to begin with. They were the shift of satirical, obnoxious, abrasive hardcore when everything was fucking youth crew and got to stay young and rules and military and fucking whatever hardcore was and kind of still is of like, just, you know, we're free from society. So like, here's more rules. Um, They were the antithesis of that. And, and I think what we were able to capture this time capsule was like that progression, but like through like... Yeah, it looks like shit because we had to shoot it through Zoom and kind of figure out what we were doing on the fly. Um, but the pandemic also allowed us access to literally any for everyone that would probably be on tour or busy doing stuff because nobody was doing anything. So it's like, oh, hey, Keith, M., you like Dead Guy? You talk about Dead Guy and you're like, oh, man, I saw Dead Guy with this guy. You should talk to this guy or this lady or like whoever. And then we hit them up and we're like, oh, hey, that's awesome. You got stuff to say about that guy? Let's film it. And it became this like very kind of special moment in history, like music history. And I think technologically, um, and then they got back together, which I (laughs) never expected in a million, million years. I didn't expect that at all. When I, I, you know, I was very surprised when I heard they got back together when they, was it true? They, they hadn't all spoken to each other like that prior to this documentary. Not at all. So what happened? Did you guys talk to Dave originally and then he went back to the band to pitch the documentary or were they already going to do it? Like what, how did that work out? Dave just wanted to move forward with it because we were enthusiastic and younger and we're like, yeah, dude, we just want to make stuff. We just want to make cool stuff with our friends who gives a shit if anybody likes that. Um, Wasn't that the point of your band to begin with? And he talked to all of them and they, they kind of started talking a little bit and, and, they got in a room together in New Jersey and it was filmed and there was not high expectations that the people involved were actually going to show up. And I think once they all saw each other, it was like, Oh man, we're like teenagers again. Like why were we mad at each other? Which is like, I think pretty cool on top of um, being part of a handful of bands reunions in, in recent years, like Seisha being one of them, which mm. I have to fly to Chicago tomorrow for their shows with um, Page 99, because uh, oh, nice. I've been working on a film project with them. And there was issues in that band, 
personalities like they didn't last very long you know they were together for like 19 years and just kind of imploded because they were young and didn't know what they were doing or where to put those feelings which i think is the case of most bands and they got back in the room they were like why were we mad at each other it's really kind of you know for for bands that i love that were important to me to like be a part of what they're doing now but cooler to like see that friendship reunited is like that's awesome man like when you reconnect with people that you smell, we're like, um, uh, we're immersed in like their energy and like, there's so many like almost teenage young feelings at one point to like take that away, go in your own separate ways and then come back is like incredible. Was everybody worried that Tim wasn't going to show up? Yes. <laughs> there was, there, there was a scene in the documentary where 100%. someone's, I think it was, uh, I think it was Dave, Dave waiting, was for, waiting Tim. for Tim. Yeah. And he's like, he's, he going to show up? I don't think it was like a brutal fallout. They just were young and like, didn't know what the fuck they were doing. And it fell apart. And Tim, I think was one of the more responsible at that time. Like he had some money and was like working and like already had a career kind of going a little bit. Um, as the documentary discusses this, is he's like, I had money to buy records and food on tour. Right. You know, cause I saved money cause I was going on tour. Um, that creates, you know, uh, almost a, a class system of, well, why do you get that? And I don't, we're in a band together, you know? Right. And it's like, well, right. fuck you get a job. <laughs> right. Right. I was actually thinking about that today. Cause I watched the, uh, the documentary and I was like, yeah, if I was young and broke, like that was my mindset when I was young and broke. Like if my girlfriend made more money than me, I'd be like, well, she should just pay for me. Yeah, of because, course. <laughs> like, but the, that's the way you think when you're young. Yeah, I was, I had a handful of friends that came from way more money than I did. And I feel bad about it now because I was an asshole. But like, there was this kind of like, yeah, man, your parents pay your rent. You buy, you buy beers. Right. <laughs> I don't have any money. But, but. You owe me because I'm your friend. I'm just Those kidding. people whose parents do pay for everything tend to be the cheapest. That's, yeah, you're totally right about that. I think that's why they have all that money. <laughs> it's very plausible. Their parents taught them well. It's very plausible. <laughs> or they got threatened to have that yanked out from under them so they didn't spend any of it. <laughs> Were you in the room when they actually played together for the first time? I was not. I was unavailable and I will always regret that. Yeah. I mean, that's a that's like a huge moment yeah. in history. Absolutely. You know, the the documentary, I do like the style because I, I saw a clip of it, I don't know, a long time ago, but it was one of the Zoom clips. I just saw people on Zoom and, I, and then I was afraid the whole documentary was going to be on Zoom. And I was like, oh no, like Zoom reminds me of the pandemic right. and that makes me, my stomach nauseous. I don't want to see that. But it's not like that. Like I like the style. I like the animations. There's in-person video. There's a little bit of Zoom and it's compelling. Like I, I was... I was compelled through the entire hour and a half. I was like, this is really good. Bill did an incredible job of moving the story along. along. And there's like a lot of cuts to that movie, man. I would get like a new cut every five days. And I'd be like, oh, we got to watch it. And I would like sit through all of it again and be like, dude, this is, this is lagging here. Like you got to speed this up, like whatever. And he's a great editor. And like when the when we did, um, we did a premiere at, uh, in Philly at, uh, underground arts and, uh, before decibel beer and metal festival. And then dead guy played the next day. And it was the f- first time I had seen the final, final cut. Cause after a while I just c- kind of got burnt out and I was like, yeah, Bill, this looks great. <laughs> I just kind of stopped watching them. Um, <laughs> and we sat and watched it and I was like, fuck dude, this is actually really good. And like moves yeah. along and like the reception was great. And then we did a couple more showings and I kind of got burnt back out by it. And I was like, ah, I don't know, like whatever, man, we did the best we could. And then we had it in a film festival in New York, like a year and a half ago, maybe. And he and I met for lunch and like got some drinks and went to the screening and, oh yeah, it was, um, it was June of 2023. Um, and it was about a month after our friend Trevor from Black Dahlia murder killed himself. 
And I forgot Trevor was in the documentary. And Bill and I are at this screening and we're sitting there and Trevor comes on and I just heard that dude's voice. And he and I just looked at each other and we cheersed each other and we both just started bawling in the movie theater. And like our friends were like, are you guys all right? And I was like, do you want to like go get more drinks? <laughs> and I got up <laughs> and like we went to the bar, the movie theater, and I was just like, I forgot Trevor was in this, man. And like, how cool is it? Not only that we got to watch our friend's career, but then we got to bring our friend into this project we made, um, talking about a band that was like very important to all of us growing up. And it was like this celebration of like, not only did we finish this film, dead guy got back together. We got Trevor in it, which is awesome. And now we get to sit here cause we're alive and celebrate that motherfucker and celebrate the fact that like it, created a huge bond between bill and i and it was just like this is kind of now just about friendship and like what's better than that that's beautiful wow (laughs) i'm a poet too do you ever do you ever introduce yourself to people and say hey i helped get dead guy back together that's what Um, i would do it's it's a weird thing of like how do you talk about yourself without sounding like a douchebag you know i know no i'm Uh, just kidding no it's a that's a valid question you know i think most people are like who (laughs) Um, you know, but to like us select nerds who like understood the importance of that band, it's such a wild, phenomenal feat that I would have never expected, you know, Bill and I too, because we're both from Michigan, as I mentioned, we've been at a million of the same shows, shooting photos, him doing video. Like I was a big fan of his old band, the Nan Rouge. Uh, they were like a Detroit, like metalcore band, um, saw him play, never met. We never met until here, you know? So it's like, you're from Philly or Bucks County. Uh, (laughs) I'm from Detroit, Ypsilanti. But now you and I met through our mutual friends. And and like that kind of, you never know where you're going to end up, especially like there's no way you and I haven't been in the same room together like a million times. I just missed each other, you know? And for the have like those encounters later of people that like you could have met at any point in your life, but then you meet them kind of like cosmically when you're supposed to, if that makes sense. You know, I read a Carlos Castaneda book and, and then you make something with them. It's weird. Uh, Cause I've thought about this and now I'm thinking about it again, that you brought it up. Now I've been to a million shows at St. Vitus and you know, a bunch of shows in New York city over the years, but I never met many of the bands or people or promoters or any photographers, any of that, because, you know, I was just a guy going to shows uh, most of the time by myself. Cause a lot of my friends didn't listen to this music up here. They're all back down in uh, Philadelphia, but now I do this podcast. So I've taken one step to the right and there is everybody that I've met. And I'm like, wow, they were all here the whole time, but I never met them and things just shifted a bit. And it's different now. It's kind of crazy if you think about it. That is crazy. But at the same time, like, this is how you were meant to meet all of us. Yeah. Because even wow. like when when I was talking with Joe Grillo about wanting to like do, do this podcast because as a fan and plus like iodine connection, I do a lot of work with them. Um, he was like, oh, yeah, you don't know Keith? And I was like, no, dude, like I, we, if I knew him, I would just holler at Keith. Uh, <laughs> and he's like, oh yeah, 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 you guys will get along great. I'll introduce you. Um, which was incredible. But like, I think it's more fun that we get to meet this way and discuss the fact that we never got to meet versus like random encounters years ago where like it probably wouldn't have culminated to getting to the same point where we are sitting right now. I like this. This is a good place to meet people. I think I'm less awkward on here, actually. Yeah, sure. And and if, (laughs) you know, I, I'm less awkward around a camera. If I have a camera in my hands, it gives me something to do. You know, it's like fidgeting with like a cigarette or something. You're less awkward because you're behind a microphone. Yeah. Like you can't see me right right now. I, I, I rock back and forth in my chair and I have one of those, uh, those gum flosser things. And I like meticulously poke around my mouth. So (laughs) it's really, it's really good that there's no video because it would be gross. I love that. I keep stabbing myself in in the hand with uh, a guitar pick that I've seen at my desk. (laughs) Amazing. So this month, no, wait. So right now the St. Vitus bar book. That thing is shipping. 
It is it's shipping. shipping. People are getting it. I've seen pictures. Everyone, the book is called The St. Vitus Bar Book, The First 10 Years, An Oral and Visual History. Now, uh, this book is available to purchase, right? We can get it. We can get it today if we want to. We can. Yeah. So let's talk about this. When did you conceive the idea for this book? You said it took three years to put everything together, right? It took three production years, but the idea goes back to probably like 2018-ish. I was bartending at Vitus. Oh, even further back before that. I, before I even worked there, you know, I've been hanging out for years and have been friends with, with the crew there for, since it opened. And I was like, you guys need pictures up in here. They're like, why? And I'm like, well, why the fuck would you not have pictures of what's happened here in the bar? Um, so I installed a handful, like I had 15 or 20 photos um, above the crown molding of, of the entranceway of the first construction of the bar. And I swapped that out a couple of times. And, you know, I worked there for a while and doing showing work in the city is not easy unless like you are somehow affiliated with an art community or your parents have bought your way into an art community. And there it's just, it's harder and harder to like get your work up on walls, especially places that aren't like one night pop-up, which I absolutely hate doing and just refuse to do anymore because it's a waste of my time. And I had pitched to them like wanting to do gallery shows like CBs used to do gallery shows and uh Caroline Harrison and I had been who used to do all like the social media um and and she was kind of a backbone glue of the bar for a long time um she and I who she's also an incredible illustrator and has like a very very cool c- career creating very fascinating um macabre ornate illustrations. I don't know how she does what she does. I don't have that attention span. That's why I have a camera. She and I were discussing, like, we know all these people. There's so many creative people that come through here, uh, from musicians to painters to like six degrees of rad art uh, is abound in those four black walls. Let's do something somewhere. So the idea was to do like Vitus presents gallery shows where they can be up for a week or two or a month and then do, you know, like opening parties, have DJs, all all that shit. And we had found a space um, around the corner from the bar, which seemed like it was going to be like a pretty good, affordable option. And we started tossing names into a hat of like who we wanted to pursue. And I woke up one day and I went with some friends to go to sleep no more. And on our way to sleep no more, we got a call that sleep no more was canceled because yeah, pandemic hit. And, and it was like, what do we do? Um, so I had pitched doing kind of like a, a magazine or a zine or some sort of book maybe. Um, and that kind of grew into like, let's just make a book. And I don't know that the bar was necessarily like into that. I know that they had been approached about doing something similar before by another person, but they trusted me with it because I, I was, they've been a part of the place for a long time and they finally like greenlit what I wanted to do. And I still had the advantage of the pandemic. We had moved to New Jersey at that point. I had set up an office in the attic and I treated that shit like a job and I would work 40 to 60 hours a week on it for at least the first year and a half like it's all I did. I didn't have a job. I was getting that government money, that pandemic money. Uh, and I had freelance stuff like here and there and like was able to get by, but you know, everybody's experiences were different. Mine was the day we woke up and the world shut down. I was like, Oh shit, I'm retired. This is what being retired is. I have to use every second of my time to be, to pursue every idea in my head because I'm never going to get this opportunity again especially the way the world is now. Like I'm not going to be able to retire. Um, I'll just casually get by until I die. And I didn't want to wake up on April 25th of 2024 talking to Keith M and not be like, yeah, I did this, 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 and this, and this, because why, why would I want to just sit around? Like it also just kept my mind occupied and helped me cope with, dealing with whatever that, uh, you know, existential dread and stress was 
on a, on a day-to-day basis. And frankly, like I have a very unpopular, uh, I don't want to say love. I have a very unpopular relationship with the pandemic of, I had so much fucking fun. (laughs) I had an absolute great time because work sucks. I don't ever want to go to work. I want to play and I want to make art and I want to listen to jams and I want to be 12 forever sitting in my bedroom because when I was 12, that made me happy. And when at 42, it makes me happy and it just keeps, you know, that's my mental balance is just creating things and exploring ideas in my head. So to be able to wake up and be like, Oh man, what if I got a bucket of pig blood and painted with it? Mm. and mix that with this thing and then did this and this and this and this. All right, let's go to the butcher and get pig blood. And then I could just spend the whole day and be like, no, nah, that doesn't work. Next idea. Versus now having a full-time job, it's like, okay, I got this idea on Monday. Maybe I'll get around to it by Thursday. And by Saturday, I'm like, yeah, this, is, this isn't this is going to work. And I got to move on to the next thing. Or if it does work, it's like, oh, okay, well, how long is it going to take me to finish whatever this idea is? Because 40 hours of my week, I have to sit through Teams meetings, listening to a bunch of people who don't know how to run a company, talk at all of us about how we're losing money because they don't know what they're doing. Like, it's my (laughs) fucking fault. I take pictures of shit. Leave me alone. (laughs) (laughs) I just want to go listen. I just want to go listen to my cassette tapes and my Gravedigger's tape in, in my attic and paint aliens and like... You know, one of the things I I woke up, I ended up stumbling upon doing was um, I got really fascinated with the idea of, you know, you said earlier, uh, data analyst, right? What is the data of what kind of porn people are watching where in the country during the pandemic? And does that increase or decrease based on married couples being home or single people being alone? I was obsessed with this idea simply because there are things that are based on either technology or things that you hide can hide it you can hide in your daily life because you aren't surrounded by either your loved one or your family or your friends uh trapped at home so how do you deal with that i don't have a kid but like how would my lifestyle change if I did have a child and I work nine to five versus if I had a child and that child was with me at home all goddamn day, you know, <laughs> like I was just obsessed with this porn statistic. Um, and my girlfriend is a big fan of Egon Shield, and we had this Egon Shield print in our bathroom and I was sitting there and I was like, I could do that. I could paint that. I'm going to try and paint that, which very quickly turned into like my UFO my adolescent UFO and alien obsession, uh, always checking out like UFO books out of my elementary school library. Of I like, did that too. Yeah, dude, it's the best. Yeah. What was your favorite one? I don't know. I was on vacation with my friend in North Carolina and we were at some big fair or indoor something that had books and there was this giant hardcover book of UFOs, sightings and stories. And I, I bought that and that, it was it was really cool. And how many times? You couldn't, how many times you couldn't did you get read? it anywhere. I I couldn't tell you. Yeah, dude, a lot. Yeah, that became like yeah. So you understand? I'm very yeah. much with you. I had a book. I didn't buy it, uh, but I checked it out of the library. Very similar. And I was like, what if I made Egon Shiel influenced alien porno? <laughs> and. I started pursuing this late one night. My Rachel woke up the next morning. She's like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? And I was like, babe, check this out. (laughs) Why don't, can you like help me find like funny porno clips so I could like make these alien porno paintings? And she's like, yeah, sure. I was like, I just want to let you know what I'm doing. Like this is, I'm just doing research, baby girl. Um, (laughs) I spent like (laughs) six months just make like do you know like there's a whole wild world of just like yoga porn yeah the, there's there's it's they have it for everything, everything. you could imagine you yeah. know i think that the joke is is like anything that comes out any idea is like oh we got to make a porn about that um <laughs> but it that became like the first thing i did during the pandemic as a way to keep myself entertained and to like show her and she would roll her eyes at me and just be like, you're an idiot. But (laughs) 
it also became something that at her suggestion, she's like, you should make a coloring book and send it to all of our friends who are like losing their minds because they'll love it. So I made like 20 drawings of what Damien Moyel likes to refer to as aliens fingering their buttholes. And I sent a bunch of friends like this PDF that it was like, you can print this at home and, and just, you know, do, do some weed. Everybody has weed, like future weed now, future drugs, do some future drugs. And here's a way to like deal with how stressful life is. And like, <laughs> it's hilarious that like this obsession over this like data, like this, this stat of pornography, love of youthful love of aliens turned into this thing that was like, here's the least I can do to help my friends and like make them laugh since I can't see them. And like, that's fine. Uh, and then that turned into like me actually doing a painting series and like a zine, uh, Mr. Pete Ross from the wonderful band God maker helped me with this like eruption, like Van Halen eruption style porno disco, like French disco song with him just shredding, shredding riffs over it. Uh, and, and I called the whole thing labia 51 and like I made a zine and just like gave it to my friends. It's like, here's something <laughs> absolutely asinine that I made that I have to complete now because I started on the trajectory of this, have this and enjoy it and just laugh at it. That's it. That's it's just for mere amusement of life is terrible and we're all going to die. So laugh at this alien fingering its butthole. Cause I made that <laughs> and that's funny to me. <laughs> Did uh, anyone get offended at, at this PDF you sent you sent them? I, no, I don't. I don't associate with people that would be offended by anything that I would ever do or say. <laughs> um, after I made aliens fingering their buttholes, you know, like it was like, what's the next project? And the Vitus book kind of started to come along, and and I digress. Sorry, I went off like tangent there, but it was again like pandemic. Like it's so hard not to like get sucked back into like what you do during the pandemic because it was just such a wild time. But I really tried to look at that as like this is a unique opportunity that we may not get again. So you have to take full advantage and not be lazy and just really like go bust your ass and work and make cool stuff. And that led to the Vitus book. Mm -hmm. Similarly to the dead guy thing, I had access to people. I don't know that I would have gotten access as easily to uh, based on the fact that they were still like kind of sitting around and not doing anything on top of the fact that I had time to treat this as a full-time job. And I mean, I really like, I'm not kidding when I was like 60 hours a week deep, just emailing, calling, emailing, calling, trying to figure out designs, gather assets. There's bands that like might people might be like, why didn't you include this? It's probably because I couldn't find it. You know, it's insane. There's there's bands that are bigger that I was like surprised for like how are they're not pictures. It took me a year and a half to find pictures of anthrax. Really? Um every time I die. That band is very big popular to a certain demographic of people. It took me two years to find somebody that had pictures of that show. You know, one of the hardest parts about doing this podcast is finding good pictures of the bands to mm -hmm. use for the assets, right? And you'd be surprised. Well, you wouldn't be surprised, but a lot of people would be surprised. Like bands you would expect to have a ton of great photos sometimes don't. Yeah, there's like none. And then bands that you, you know, you would expect to have no photos. Sometimes they have a lot of good ones. It just, it's, it just throws you for a loop sometimes. Absolutely. Um, yeah. and that, that became, it became like an internet sleuth. I did my research as the whites like to say of just digging and digging and digging and digging. You know, I Flickr is a website I don't think about and I haven't thought about in 15 years and forgot was even existed. I found a lot of people on there just through like the hashtags of same Vitus bar um, that I reached out to and was like, your pictures of this are great. I would love for you to be a part of this book. Um, and, you know, cause I, the, the original idea was to do a collaboration with my old roommate, Jay Morris, who did a lot of show posters of his posters, my photos. And I realized really quickly, I was like, yeah, but that doesn't do it justice because I, my music tastes are biased. And there's things that happen there that I think are really important that just kind of weren't for me. So it would be ignorant of me to not include everything that I can find, you know, and we cut down a list to about like a hundred and 150 
shows that happen out of like literally thousands. I think I, at one point I had an Excel file because um, it already Shepard did like a really incredible job of keeping a running list of every band that had played there from like opening through I think like 2015. And then they gave me access to the ticket fly ticket web, like the ticketing sites. So then that had all like the show listings that tickets got sold to. Um, and I compiled this list and I was like, this is un- <laughs> like this unrealistic amount of people. We have to cut this down. It was very important to me to include not just the battle jackets and ball sweat of, of what's happened at St. Vitus Bar, but also the, the full scope of underground music from the emo revivals to punk rock, hardcore, a uh, little bit of hip hop. Unfortunately, no country music. I'm sorry to tell you that, Keith. Um, uh, that's fine with me. I'm, I, I don't want to disappoint you. Um, <laughs> it's mainly because those people spent too much money on alcohol and cowboy hats. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't want it to just be fucking metal because it's boring. I love yeah. metal. It's my world. Like, I spent 25 years now shooting that genre specifically. And, and that's cool. But I also was like so excited that jazz june played <laughs> like so excited that play you know drowning man played and there was six people there and it was i was st- one of those people there, see we were there yeah and now we're men- talking now how awesome was that show to watch simon brody be sober on stage and then play in front of no one <laughs> that it was amazing and uh, I, i'm gonna wait no wait i'll tell you that later too okay but uh i was at the show and it was funny remember when he wasn't around the like the whole band was on stage and they're like where's simon where's simon and someone in the crowd someone in the crowd was like uh-oh here we go again <laughs> that was Which funny is perfect yeah um and there's there's so many things like that that like i just wanted to include because i thought it was cool um yeah you know we had bjork dj there a couple of times and then there's like the big you know underplays of carcass which was incredible obituary which was incredible the the megadeth thing which is still bonkers that it even happened and then obviously, mineral uh mineral playing like that was awesome took me a really long time to find mineral photos but i tracked some down um and, you know, the power of what that bar has been was not just catering to one thing because their interests are not just one genre. Our interests are not just one genre uh, for not only business sustainability, but also for just like the boredom of some genres of music make more than the others. Some genres of music draw less than desirable crowds than others. The end. <laughs> <laughs> so three years of production work went into this book and it shows it's beautiful. I love the cover. I read through the whole thing. It the, Just the layout is amazing. The selection of bands, there's something for everybody. It was pretty fascinating reading about the Nirvana show again. Were you there for that reunion? I was not. Yeah. I was not. That would have been really hard to get into, I think, even if you knew somebody there, it looked like. Yeah, I part of me will always hold it against them for not telling me so I could come <laughs> shoot. Um, but I also kind of think it's cool that it went down the way that it did as a band that was like so radically important to me. And I think a lot of people to watch those songs get played you know, in a way that like really, I think pays tribute to like what that band actually was and not what they became, uh, is awesome. And I, I think there's honestly no other person that I would appreciate them getting the opportunity over myself to shoot that than Keith Marlowe, who did get into the show and did take pictures. Um, cause Keith is a great dude. And one of the one of the few people who I respect of the of of the music photo genre that like he deserved to be there because that motherfucker's worked his ass off his entire life in the same circles and worlds that kind of I have and like that's you just get those treats like cosmic treats sometimes of like I just happen to be here you know that Descendants show was one of those for me 
of oh you were at that one oh, the hot water music yeah, descendants show that was as you can read about it in the book uh if you go to stbinesbar.com where the book is available that i just happened to be there like i went and was shooting the the riot fest uh in williamsburg on the waterfront and the ghostbuster storm came in and the bronx were playing and Maddie got on the microphone. He's like, here's to your shitty future. And they played shitty future. And then the sky opened up and they were like, show's canceled. Everything's done. And we just ran to Vitus because where else were we going to go? And by the time we got there, they were like, the descendants are playing in an hour. Hot water's playing <laughs> an hour. We're like, what are you talking about? And they showed up with their gear. And um, Tucker Rule from Thursday and I were hammered because we've been drinking all day. And we helped Bill carry his drums in. Like we helped them load in, which I honestly got to be honest with you. I don't remember, but th- he told me that story and I already told me that story, uh, not together. So I assume that that's true. And <laughs> within an hour and a half, two hours, like the descendants were playing and I was got to document that, you know, I got to sh- take a picture of Milo with the Vitus logo behind his head at this bar. My friends built with a band that is responsible for shaping a lot of what came for 35, 40 years after it in a room that like I named the last time the descendants played in a room, the size of Vitus that wasn't like some douchey industry shit in LA, you know? Right. So that's my Nirvana, like that descendant show, you know, in both of those shows, I think were very, as you can read in the book, um, crucial to the turning point of look what we can do overnight like international sensations of people being like what are you talking about the descendants played of vitus are you talking about nirvana played of vitus what are you talking about refused played of vitus you know and those those late night kind of secret last minute things which given the way brooklyn is now i think it's getting more and more difficult to get away with stuff like that was in retrospect and even at the time you know trying to live in the, the now of the situation is is fucking wild that some of that stuff went down uh and everybody for the most part was cool about it yeah I, it's pretty amazing as i was going through the book there was a ton of shows i never even knew happened yes yeah, you'd say <laughs> i well i spent most of the 2010s getting high and drunk so i, I missed out on a lot of good stuff and i was like man i wish i would have gone to this man i wish i would have gone to this but you know, it's, uh, I've seen plenty of good shows there and I'm going to a lot more nowadays. So it's, it's all good. There's, um, back to that list. Like I made, I was like, wait, this band played here. Where was yeah. I? Why didn't I go to that? Exactly. Um, you know, even as, as, as far as like the donations of like show flyers that, uh, people had made over the years that got submitted. It was like, dude, I've never seen some of this stuff. Or getting to see pictures of shows that I wasn't at. It's like, oh man, this is awesome. Now I can kind of, I know the room. I know the band. So it's kind of like, oh, I have this like fictitious memory that like I can now live vicariously through these other people's images, uh, which is awesome. That's amazing. Well, we know St. Vitus has been closed for a minute now because uh, they're working out some building issues with the city. Do you know anything that's going on there? Have you heard anything? Um that's obviously a very sensitive subject and, and cut a, a wound in, I think the heart of underground music in Brooklyn, well, in New York city in general. Um, and just kind of domestically, you know, I mean, that place has like become the epicenter of, of so much of heavy and aggressive music that I know they're hard at work trying to figure out a solution to what is going on. And I think everybody is extremely grateful, myself included, that this book now exists as uh, a barometer of what was. And they're working towards providing a future for doing something more with, you know, adding to this book of, of what will be. Yeah, I, I really hope they can work it out. You know, I've had David on the show. He's great. And I've I've met so many great people through there. I've seen so many great shows there. That was my favorite venue when it was open. And, you know, it's just, uh, I hope uh, I hope it continues. Yeah, absolutely. 
you know, I think the name and legacy will always live on. Yeah. Yeah. We'll always have that. You know, I was sad I never got to go to a show at CB's. Now, I, I did use the bathroom there once, but I, but I never got to go to a show there. So, I, I, at least, I at least have the bathroom story, but St. Vitus is my CB's. Yeah, that's like the, the most notorious thing about CB's was the bathroom. I do yeah. know that Vitus has been in talks with Newark Airport about opening up a hot dog stand. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. I'll say that again. I do know that St. Vitus Bar is in talks with Newark Airport about opening up the bow bun stand that used to be in the bar, but at the airport. So <laughs> if you want to go buy a copy of the book and eat a bow bun, um, that may or may not have been sitting in the refrigerator in the basement for the last 10 years. You will be able to do that at Newark Airport very soon. Um, <laughs> I always thought anybody who ordered those things was very brave. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think it's going to be in the Spirit <laughs> Lounge, Spirit <laughs> Airline Lounge. Um, that, that that checks out. Yeah, that didn't last very long, the bow bun. Those things actually were really good. <laughs> they were really, really good. <laughs> Nathaniel, before we hit record, I, I didn't realize this. Your uh, solo band, Nathaniel Shannon and the Vanishing Twin, you, part of your backing band was the great John Lane, who I performed with in the Darling Fire, yes? Yeah. That's amazing. Animal from the Muppets himself. <laughs> um, yeah, John is... I don't... I have a hard time wrapping my mind around how John thinks when he is behind a drum kit because I'm so ignorant towards that instrument that it is fascinating watching that dude's mind work playing this thing that I just, my brain cannot understand. Um, and I acquired years ago, I was doing the solo project as you mentioned, and I had absorbed God maker as my backing band. Um, I had, was playing a Vitus with um, Woven Hand, and I could not open for Woven Hand without a band because that would be embarrassing. And I didn't want to play along with my laptop because that was embarrassing. And I asked them to play, and Godmaker were like, yeah, sure. We'd love what you're doing. And we met a handful of times, and it kind of came together because those dudes were incredible. I think I actually showed up to practice, and they already kind of like knew how to play some of the songs because uh, they're – incredible musicians i could watch people oh, yeah. play fucking guitar all day um and archie like what he how he extends songs with a bass and adding to them in in enhancing them as almost a lead instrument is like phenomenal um so it was a really cool experience we had a really great show and i think they collectively were like could we do this more with you and i was like yeah sure let's do it I don't have to like find a band. Like <laughs> I found a band. Like I literally found a band, not people to play with, um, which is doesn't ever happen. Uh, and, and that was, you know, that kind of fizzled out during the pandemic. And I moved across the river and it made getting, um, getting to Brooklyn regularly to rehearse complicated. Um, but that was really cool, you know. So when I found out you were you were playing with them and we have a bandmate in common, I got really excited about that because John's a, a fantastic human. He's the best. Well, Nathaniel, we're just about out of time. But listen, I want to remind everybody, head to the St. Vitus website, go to the merch section and pick up this book. It's out there now. It's beautiful. There's a lot of great stuff in it, right? I'm pretty sure there's a lot of great stuff in it. You would know better than any, any of us. No, it it really is. Um, I It's surreal trying to express or talk about it in a way that isn't like <sighs> juvenile. Because uh, I've spent so much time working on it that I've almost started to like disassociate. Um, getting Walter to write the foreword. And just simply calling him, being like, would you write a forward for this? And he's like, yeah, dude, of course. Because he's the nicest guy in the world. It was like pretty rad when he sent over the, the forward for the book. Especially his story about seeing the band, St. Vitus. Or Youth of Today played with St. Vitus. I, I Somewhere, I like, want to say like Salt Lake City or something ridiculous. Where you would not think those bands would be playing together. Um, and it was cool. Uh, you know, to bring up Trevor from Black Dahlia again. I 
don't quote me on the fact that it's the last interview he ever gave, but close to and having somebody who I've known since I was a teenager contribute to like something I made based on his fandom of the location is huge, man. I get to immortalize my friend. I could tell you, dude, the th- here's what's weird. Three years of working on this thing. I think that there are five or six RIPs in that motherfucking book of people who were alive when I started working on it. Yeah. And getting a, being able to like immortalize those people and what they meant to not only their bandmates, but their friends and fans is like wild. Yeah, I I know that feeling because this podcast became weekly during the pandemic. During the first week of the pandemic, I'm like, I can make this weekly. And that's, you know, how it started taking off. And two of my friends I had on in the early days have died since that started. And I'm I'm just so happy there's like a documentation kind of of their life and musical pursuits there if, if someone wants it. And selfishly, not only them, but like them and you you know, yeah. your relationship, your friendship. Um, right. that, that's huge. Yeah. That is kind of surreal to think about, right. you know, I guess, I mean, I, I guess I brought it up with the, like the dead guy documentary of like, it's one thing to like read words from a conversation, look at a picture. It's another thing to like hear somebody's voice. And like, that's just like a different sensation of like memories, you know, the come back. Um, so whether, whatever happens with the bar, Whatever happens with every person in that book, you know, like having some sort of document of like this thing existed and kind of in real time, unfortunately, we're at a crossroads of like uncertainty of what the future holds. But um, it's not like, oh, 20 years after it closed, here's this book. It's like, no, this was kind of actively happening. Granted, there was like a pause, you know, and we did cut the book off at – um at the beginning of the pandemic, because it just seemed like a natural place to kind of stop. Um, and it was like the 10 year anniversary. Who knows what the future holds, but I hope to add another 344 pages <laughs> to it. So it could be <laughs> a book that you need, um, you know, a, a, a baby Bjorn to carry around with you to like read. Part two is coming, folks. Get ready. I hope so. I hope so, too. That guy's played there a lot of time since (laughs) since (laughs) the book. Well, Nathaniel, this has been great. Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to come on the show. And I'm going to look for you next time I'm at a show. I'll be there. I'll be there. Thank you again. This is really awesome. And I'm glad that we got to meet at least this way. Um, And I'd love to hang out. And there you have it, Nathaniel Shannon. What a great conversation. You know, I was really happy to talk to Nathaniel. I was not having a great day when I was talking to him. I was not having a great week. You know, you've heard me talk about it on the show. I was going through something last month. Something about this time of year just puts me in a not great state of mind. But after talking to Nathaniel, I felt really good that night. And you know, he's just done so much. It was really interesting hearing about his whole history. It was really interesting hearing all those stories from St. Vitus. I mean, that that venue is legendary. I've seen so many great shows there. I really hope that they open back up soon because the place is a staple for Brooklyn, for New York City, for the world. So pick up the St. Vitus Bar book. It's awesome. It looks awesome. There's a ton of great stories in it. It will be a fine addition to your collection of books. Also, the Dead Guy Killing Music documentary is on YouTube, and I highly, highly recommend it. So make sure you check that out as well. So thank you so much, Nathaniel, for coming on the show. And now we are going to speak to Sierra Binando from With Sales Ahead. All right, we are here now with Sierra Binando. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Keith. 
It's great to have you here. So tell us about your band with Sales Ahead. How did it get started? When did it get started? So uh, we are a post-hardcore band from New Jersey. We've been active for seven years. Truthfully, though, um, I've had the project for nearly 10. Um, it started out as a like a solo bedroom project. I really wanted to play post-hardcore music. And um, I recorded a demo of songs um, and then set out to find people. It took two years. And using that demo, I found the current members that we have today. Um, we've been touring regionally for most of our career. We've released a couple of EPs, and now we're about to release our debut self-recorded, self-produced full-length record on Friday, April 26th. That's very exciting. I like what I've heard so far from the record, and I'm going to get to that, but I'm curious, how did you find your bandmates? Because I don't know about you, but I find it very difficult to find people to play with. You know, the, the bands I've put together... Uh, I would find people and people would leave or I could never replace them and the band would fall apart. How did you do it? I know it's such an arduous process. Like it, it took me <laughs> years. It took me years. Um, and uh, like, for example, like I put out that demo and it wasn't until like maybe like six, seven months later that I found the first like permanent member. And that was Joe, our guitarist. Um, they happened to grab a demo from a table I was running merch at at a local show and um, and reached out. And that was how they discovered the music. Um, that was 2015. Um, we found another member, Santino, through Facebook groups. Uh, all the, the, the dozens, hundreds of days I was incessantly posting on social media, like one of those posts finally stuck and it was Santino who saw it. So um, we met a couple times and it was a good fit. So he was he was on lock. Um, Jamie, our bassist, we actually found them on Craigslist. <laughs> I, I, I was really passionate about this project. I was blasting out like musicians wanted posts anywhere I could. And by some miracle, like that one Craigslist post, like found Jamie. And, um, you know, so they, they came down, tried out and it was a great fit. We did get an, we did have another drummer in between, but um he didn't work out. So uh 2017, late 2017 was when um Joe's friend, Ryan, um magically was like available to like jam. Uh he's our drummer. And uh that was the one connection that was like fr friend of ours <laughs> instead of just like um silly like posting on the internet and just like, you know, casting out a reel and just hoping for the best. Um, you know, a lot of, you know trial and error, but it took a long time. And, you know, I think doing it that way, I think was worth it because everyone who joined was like really on board because of the the tunes. I love that. Uh, yeah. It must have felt great to finally be together in a room with everybody after years of piecing it together and playing the songs and writing together, right? Absolutely. And like, and even like through that method of finding musicians, like you don't know like how we're going to jive like the five of us, but it was, a you know, over time, like the the bond has only gotten stronger, and we've only grown uh, stronger at collaborating with each other. How did you make the initial demos? What was it? So I recorded with um, technically like the former bassist of my of with Sales Ahead, like the first ever. He was my my ex boyfriend, and like um, he and our friend Jesse, um, like we we I like wrote the guitars. Um, the vocals, and um, they kind of filled in the spaces where I couldn't. And um, I th we tracked the drums live, and I we did all the instruments like in vocals live. Um, and I think we did it in like Reaper, which is like the DAW I've been using for as long as I can remember. Where are you located, Asbury Park? We say Asbury because it's a really good catch-all. Everyone knows what and where Asbury is and what it's known for. It's like, you know, New Jersey's music city. Um, truthfully, we're all kind of spread out. Um, I'm in like Ocean County. Like most of us are in like Ocean County, New Jersey, which is like 25 minutes south. And then um, Jamie's in like North Jersey, Ryan in like Monmouth County. But um, we do play Asbury a lot. So it's not totally, not totally baseless. <laughs> And who are some of the influences for you personally and for With Sales Ahead? Now, when I, in, a, in a description of the band, I, I saw you mention Seosin. Yes. And that caught my eye because I love them. And uh, the music, uh, my favorite song that I've heard so far 
swear words really reminded me of Seosin. So I liked that. But tell me uh, some of your personal influences and some of the band influences. Thank you. Uh, that means a lot because um, someone else has said that uh, about swear words too. So I'm really glad you caught that. Thank you. Um, well, uh, my personal influences in regards to the the genre that we play are definitely uh, Circus Survive and Lower Definition. Lower Definition is actually our band's namesake. Uh, the song Miami Nights um, with Tales Ahead is a lyric in that song. Um, as far as my personal influences, uh, I've drawn a lot from pop and singer songwriters my entire life. So when I was younger, that was Michelle Branch. Um, now in like this day and age, like I, I love like pop and R&B, like Kehlani and Ariana Grande. But like when you kind of mix that with like, you know, I love Anthony Green. Uh, so it's kind of like that post hardcore delivery. But the way I write melodies is very like through that pop experience and like that, you know, like that upbringing. Um, but the band, uh, we're very much a guitar band. Uh, so examples of bands that have really driven our like our sound are Chan, Protest the Hero, or like I said, Seosin. Those are definitely like the the main, the big three. Um, but our bandmates, um, they also have like influences across like a wide variety of genres. So um prog, like carnival and periphery, but also, um, like Avenged Sevenfold and Blink-182. Um, although all these bands are so different, like the one thing that they all have in common is like they're, they're, they have iconic riffs and very memorable ones at that. So that's something we always strive for in our music. Yeah, there is a lot of good influence on everything I've heard so far. I like the mathy elements. I like the post-hardcore elements. And you can definitely hear the pop influence in the vocals too. So it's a very nice mixture of things going on. Thank you. So how did you get involved in music? I mean, were you going to punk and hardcore and post-hardcore shows locally? Like, what's your thing? How did you get involved? So uh, I've been doing music since I was like a little kid. And a lot of people say that, but genuinely, um, that was something that I just latched on to like early on. My mom tried really hard to get me involved in sports, but like I like wanted to do music. So we kind of compromised and did both. And just eventually over time, like I was getting hit with like pop flies at at softball practice and she was like okay okay I see now this is not your thing so <laughs> <laughs> um so like at some point in high school I took an interest in like playing in bands um I started going to shows locally and in New Jersey the the VFW scene was thriving around like 2009 2010 so that was when like I really like fell in love with it and then I started my own bands uh, I guess around like there's technically one like 2009 in high school that was very short lived. And then I guess the first serious one of mine was like tail end of 2010, like 2011. And um, uh, that was how I like first fell in love with like, like post hardcore, like metalcore music. So with Sales Ahead has the debut LP coming up, Infinite Void. Yes. yes. It's coming out April 26th. When did we start writing this? Where did we record it? Tell us about some of the record. Absolutely. Uh, truthfully, this started back in 2018, 2019. Um, and the the newest song that we wrote for the record is probably as new as like 2022. Um, it took a long time to, to complete because uh, we were just kind of like, we agreed like we wanted to do a full length, but... Um, we all we had so many ideas that just it just took us a long time to to finish. Um, sometimes I don't know if you ever experienced this, but like when you have like so many ideas, you kind of have like you're kind of fatigued by the thought of like tackling them all. And like common sense says, just go one at a time. But um, you know, we would kind of just try to do it all at once and then take a break. Um, and then like a few months would pass of maybe like a year and be like, oh my gosh, we have not finished this record and, <laughs> and like, we still need to do this. And so, uh, you know, it, uh, we had the luxury of like eventually coming to, um, the agreement that we would just self-produce this. So we were like, okay, like we're not locking ourselves into like a studio date, um, like a, a deposit, uh, with a producer. So like we can kind of work at our pace and go as we please on top of our full-time jobs. Our guitarist, Joe, um, we recorded um, 
most of the record in their current home, they previously lived in like another house. So it's, it was like recorded between like two different houses, but mostly their current house. And um, in their bedroom, we had like all of these like acoustic panels we built like years prior for like a, a rehearsal space, like a lockout that we used to rent. Um, so we just lined them all up in their bedroom <laughs> and that was our little studio. And they have like, um, they have their own gear that they use. And uh once we like finished writing all the material in like 2022, um, we started the recording process and that happened, that took like a year and a half, close to two years due to like some personal things that happened in between, like, you know, life stuff. And, you know, you got to pause for that and uh, take it easy. So um, your life stuff or band life stuff? Actually, band life stuff. Uh, we all actually went through our own like personal ordeals um, throughout the creation of this record that kind of also added pauses to the the creative process and then eventually the recording process. So um, for it's like there's like a lot of reasons and they're mostly justifiable that it took us this long. I mean, we definitely like have learned our lesson and like. You know, once we start a song, we do our best to just like do a little bit of work on it, like when we can every month instead of just kind of like, you know, um, pocketing it for like a rainy day. But uh, yeah, we um, we all definitely went through some pretty life changing stuff through this record. So it makes this release all the more special. Yeah, it can be difficult when you're rolling and then you have to stop because of various things go on. But I mean, that's the way it is in a band. It's three or four or five different people with different things going on. Like, I, you know, I finally got a band together and it took years to get it rolling. And we started recording and then one of the guys had to go away for like two or three months. And I was like, no, no, what am I going to do? But then you, you have to remember, or at least in my case, like I'm inventing the timelines and deadlines and everything else. Like, no one else knows about them. So I was like, oh, right. I can just relax. It's fine. That's the thing, right? Like, you know, we we felt so bad, like leading up to this release, like having been in a band for so long, not having this record done. And sometimes when we meet people, even as recently as Friday at a show, uh, you know, they asked how long we'd been around and I told them and they were like, oh, that's a long time. <laughs> but like, <laughs> um, you know, we're all just a bunch of like lower middle class folks, like, you know, the the band stuff. As much as we love it, you know, we're, we're kind of doing it on top of like bills and stuff we got to pay and, and, you know, like life obligations. So I think we're doing the best we can, like all things considered, um, you know, and, and like you said, like uh, the passage of time, like when you've been working on a project, uh, like you experience that, but like no one else is experiencing that. So then the project drops and it's like no time passed at all. And like no one has any idea what it went into it. So it's like, it doesn't even matter. <laughs> right. Well, you guys did an excellent job with the production. It sounds great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that a ton. Is there an overall theme for the record or do you just kind of decide what each song is going to be about? Tell us about that. The overall theme for the record is very much like doomsday. Um, you know, there's a looming peril. Um, and when I say this, I'm saying this as a person who has chronic anxiety. <laughs> so that's what it feels like, you know, all the time, even moment to moment, like, having like you know you know maybe like an anxiety attack on like some odd like thursday you know um the there are several songs that have like a lyrical through line that like tie together that that theme that you know like there the infinite void that looms over our like our own futures like it's it's like the the fear of facing the unknown and like the record is about going through a journey where it opens like you know everything everything feels like the sky is falling and like, you know, I, you know, making sense of your purpose in life. But by the end of the record, like the finale is like, okay, like my future is unknown and, and vast and terrifying, but you know, like I've come to terms with this, like I'm facing it head on. Like I can rest knowing that like the future is uncertain and that is okay. I like that. Yes. I, uh, well, I also suffer from anxiety. I don't know if it's chronic though. Like, do you do you have actual like panic attacks and that kind of stuff? I have very frequent anxiety attacks. I've maybe experienced a panic attack once. I think that's why I never thought I had it. It wasn't until like I was 26 that I started putting the pieces together. I know that I definitely have ADHD. I've spoken with a doctor about it. I haven't been able to see a psychiatrist, but I strongly feel that a lot of my like emotional, physical, physical symptoms align with anxiety 
And um, you know, like I have to do things like I can't drink as much caffeine anymore, <laughs> which stinks. <laughs> um, and, you know, I have to like uh, I never noticed like how physical it is, like constricting your, your throat, your breath, um, the need to breathe extra air when you don't. And like that was that was crazy to, to learn that that's like an anxiety symptom. Um, so that's kind of how it's manifested for me. So it'll, you'll have actual physical symptoms. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the real deal. Mine is like regular anxiety. Um, if I have to call somebody on the phone who I've never spoken to before, it'll take me like two or three days to do it. Yes, I know exactly what that is. If I have to email somebody, like, you know, I get a lot of emails for the podcast. It'll, sometimes it'll take me days to reply if I do reply because I'm just nervous about talking to people or saying yes or saying no. And I, I hate asking anybody for anything ever. Like I will put myself through the most horrendous things just to not have to ask anybody for anything because I, I don't want to feel like I'm bothering anybody. That is so valid. Do you also like try to carry everything in one trip from the store and not ask for help? Because I do that all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 I, I almost killed myself because I didn't want to my amp is really high up in the practice space. And I'm like, I don't want to ask anybody or have the guy come all the way upstairs. So I'm going to lift it down. And I hurt my back. Oh. Uh, not bad, but everything's fine. And then, uh, yeah, I only, I get every meal delivered, right? Right. And I'll, some, sometimes I'm, anxiety is high. So I'll peer out the blinds like Smeagol or something. And I'll wait for him to drop off the food and leave, <laughs> completely leave. And then I'll go outside and get it and come back in. I do and sometimes I go out and just get it and say hi. It, dep- it all depends on my mood. Yeah, that's the thing, right? Like, you know, like you can work out the logic in your head, like, okay, this person's not going to eat me if I greet them at the door or like if I make this phone call and maybe fumble a word. But like, it's <laughs> get it's your brain is wired to try to protect you, even though it's not really protecting you, it's holding you back. But that's, you know, that's just how your brain works and like working through that um decision making process or that process in your head like trying to undo that is is very difficult sometimes yeah but hey we're making it work we're still alive right yeah exactly (laughs) (laughs) so we have infinite void the debut lp from with sales ahead coming out april 26th and everybody by the time you hear this it will be out so please make sure you check it out and pick up a copy and support the band and go see them if you have the opportunity. Sierra, tell us what's coming up. Do we have tours? Do we have shows? Uh, what what can we expect from With Sales Ahead? So after the record drops on Friday, April 26th, we'll be leaving for the Sales and Space Tour on Friday, May 3rd with our friends in the band uh, Space Weather. So uh, that tour will be hitting the Midwest, Southeast, uh, South, Midwest, Southwest, and Southeast. We're starting in Pittsburgh. Um, it goes through down through um, to Texas, uh, picks back up in Orlando, and then we go back up to Jersey through the the East Coast. So it'll it'll end in Richmond. Um, what else? Uh, we it hasn't been announced yet, but we're doing something in Baltimore on um, the seventeenth after tour ends. Um so I guess keep an eye out on our social media for that. I'm sure it'll be announced by the time this drops, but um just in case. Uh but yeah, Baltimore will be hitting on the 17th. We have a show in Philly on Friday, June 28th with Secret Garden and um Sincerely. And and that's really it for right now. Um, you know, we're looking to tour as much as we can the rest of the year. We look forward to really pushing this album. Uh we're really proud of it. And so we're very excited about this album cycle. Awesome. Well, Sierra, I'm looking forward to hearing more. I wish you and the band continued success. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Keith. This was an honor. I absolutely enjoyed every moment. (laughs) 